Hello everyone and in today's lesson we're going to take a walk on the streets of rage as we look into different VDP plane sizes as well as looking how to handle enemy sprites on large level maps because I understand this is an issue that lots of people are having problems with. However, before we get into the programming side of things, I just want to take a closer look at the graphic assets we're going to be using in today's lesson because although Streets of Rage 2 did up the ante in terms of graphics for sure, I still think Streets of Rage 1 is a really good looking game. If we zoom in and take a closer look for example at this brickwork, you'll see that it's a very simple repeating pattern and it uses a few colours and there's nothing too complicated here and if you look at it really zoomed up like this, it looks very simple, almost too simplistic. And the same for the ground here, you can see it's just using two colours, it's a very basic repeating pattern. But if we zoom out, we can see that everything fits together perfectly, it looks really great. It gives a very gritty kind of uh, inner city feel that you want with a beat em up, but on the other hand it's still very colourful. Of course if you have too many repeated tile patterns it looks a bit too much like an 8-bit game, but Streets of Rage has plenty of these um, little special areas, for example the posters, the graffiti, uh, some of the brickwork coming out and even on the fencing you see some of the iron fencing is turned up a bit so it gives it a bit of variety while still keeping the VRAM requirements quite low. And it managed to achieve this great effect of this street scene here while using so few colours as you can see from the palette in the top left hand side of the screen. As someone who's currently in the middle of creating lots of new graphics for a new Mega Drive game, i.e. my GG Shinobi remake, looking at these old really good looking games is a really great inspiration to me. I think as well as the programming side, I think there is a lack of pixel artists who knew, know how to do good graphics for the Mega Drive to the Mega Drive specs. So I think in the future, maybe once my pixel art skills get good enough in a couple of years time, I'd like to start doing more lessons on creating new graphics for the system too. Okay, getting back to the programming side of things, our starting off point will be pretty much this um, lesson we did last year, remember, when we uh, covered how to do a large scrolling foreground against a parrot scrolling background. And for that, of course, I used the Shinobi 3 background and a, a Revenge of Shinobi foreground with the Shadow Dancer dog sprite. And as usual, I will post the completed source code for this tutorial on my Patreon, so any Patreon supporters can go there to download it. At the beginning of the video I mentioned that people were having problems when putting enemy sprites on a large map and the issue is this, so here we've got one single uh, boss sprite here and we've only got one instance of him in the whole entire map but as you move to the right you can see that his sprite keeps on repeating over and over again despite there being only one of him in the program code. Speaking of the programming code, if we look here, we can see that we've defined, uh, defined the sprite as usual and put his X and Y coordinates. And if we go a bit further down, we can see where we add the um, enemy sprite to the game code. So just after the player sprite, and if we go further down, we can see that we do the updating the sprite position within the camera function. So with that being the case, why do we keep seeing this sprite over and over again within the level map, despite there being only one instance of him in the code? Well, if you cast your mind back to when we did the lesson on parallax scrolling, you may recall that when we scroll the X or the Y coordinates of the background in any one direction, very quickly it will repeat over and over again. And in effect, the same thing's happening with the sprites here. The point at which the screen starts repeating itself is determined by the plane size and we can actually change that here with this function. The default value of this is 64 tiles in width and 32 tiles in height and that equals um, 512 pixels in the width and uh, 256 by height. So that's why I said to make that your map size in the previous tutorial. However, as you can see here, we can change these values. So the height or the width can either be 32 tiles or 64 tiles or 128 tiles. Here you can see a graphical representation of the default plane size with the pink representing the screen, the 320 by 224 screen or camera. This second one here is with the width extended to 128 tiles. Now that would only represent 1024 pixels which isn't too big in terms of a level size, it's smaller than the level size we're using here. And then you can see that if we use this um, function anyway, we're going to get some very strange results. As well as it messing up the foreground and background layers, you can see that in terms of the sprite, how, frequent, how often it reappears, it doesn't seem to make a difference because this plane size seems to affect the backgrounds only. But given the limits of the size of the plane size and the fact that it puts more strain on the VDP anyway, that wouldn't even be a good solution for us in any case. So don't worry, I do have a solution for our sprite problem. But in the meantime, I'm going to take you through an example where changing the plane size is very useful. 
For my GG Shinobi remake, I have to recreate this intro sequence here where the different colored ninjas, they kind of fall down from the top of the screen like this. This is what the foreground graphic looks like and if I use the regular plane size you'll see they'll be too small to achieve the effect that I'm going for. What I need to do, I need to keep all of the ninjas off screen and then slide them down one by one but you can see here the vertical height at the um, default plane size is just too small. However if I change the plane size so that the um, width is 64 as normal but now the height is 64 instead of 32 then in that case I have a space of 512 by 512 pixels instead of the default 512 and 256. And that gives me enough vertical space to keep the ninjas off screen until I'm ready to um, scroll them on screen one by one using vertical tile scrolling. And I will cover vertical tile scrolling in a lesson later on this year so you should be able to recreate a similar effect to this on your own. So to summarize, I think changing the plane size, that function is mostly useful when creating these kind of cut scenes or intros where you're moving background elements from off screen or to on screen. But for regular gameplay, it's best to leave it at its default size. Okay, with that out of the way, now let's cover how to fix our little enemy sprite problem. So just to recap, at the moment we're using the set position function within SGDK to update our sprite position on the map. But as we can tell, it's not working as we want. So we're going to create a new function, a very similar one, but one which updates our enemy sprite correctly so it doesn't reappear. If we examine the original SGDK function here, we can see it takes three pieces of information, uh, which sprite we're using and also the X and Y coordinates of the sprite as an S16 number. Now you may recall that means assign 16-bit integer, a 16-bit whole number, anything from pretty much minus 32,000 to plus 32,000. However, of course, we're using a fix 32 number for the X and Y coordinates of our both our enemy and our player sprite. If you want deeper info on this, you can watch the um, lesson from last year on data types, but we pretty much use this so we can use decimal places, not just whole numbers. And that's obviously useful for the physics engine, especially when we have uh, jumping and gravity, but even for walking, it's good to have decimal numbers rather than just whole numbers. However, because this um, SGDK function, it demands a whole number, an integer, we have to do a conversion before we put it into the function. So that's why we use this fix32 to int and the brackets just to convert the number from fix32 to a regular integer. Now this new camera Y, new camera X, if you recall, it just helps us offset the position of the sprite uh, in terms of where the camera position is. So if we delete it and we recompile, we'll get this very strange result where the uh, sprite pretty much stays at the exact same uh, position on the screen, no matter how the camera moves. So we have to include that just to offset the position of the enemy sprite in terms of the camera. So now let's put that adjustment back in again so that things are back to normal again. So we can now go ahead and we can create our own function, a similar function to the SPR set position, including SGDK, but one which fixes our problem. Just as when we created the handle input in the camera functions, first we're going to go to the top just above where it says int main and we're going to give it a name. So give it whatever name you want. I'm going to call mine set to enemy position and open the brackets and don't forget the semicolon. But the difference here with the handle input and camera function is for this one, we're going to ask the uh, programmer to give us some information. So just as with the um, SGDK function we've been using to set a sprite position, we're first going to ask for which sprite we're going to be using. So we use a data type here is the sprite data type and we're going to give it a name. It can be any name you want. So I'm going to call it enemy sprite. And this is the um, representation we're going to use of this sprite within our function. We're also going to ask for the X and Y coordinates of the sprite too. But a difference is from the regular SGDK uh, function is we're going to ask it as a fixed 32 number. And then we're going to do conversion from a fixed 32 to an integer within our function rather than asking for it before when we put it into our function. Don't worry, this is a little confusing at the moment. It will become clear once we actually write our function down below. So at the very bottom below our camera function, we're going to paste that and we're going to open the brackets. Now, this is going to be our new function here. For these three pieces of information, we're asking for the player and the representative names we've given them. For example, enemy sprite and enemy X and enemy Y. These only exist and you can only use them within the function itself. So we can, for example, whether the player gives us, the programmer gives us enemy X, we can change that to uh, eight. 
And don't forget the fixed 32 in the bracket since this is a fixed 32 number, not a regular integer. However, if we try and use that outside of the function, for example, in the while loop in the main game loop here, we can see it's not coming up in the IntelliSense and it's going to give us an error too. So we can say enemyx equals fix32 open brackets 9 and it's going to give an error and say enemyx is undefined. That's because we defined it within the function only. So you can only use these within the function itself, not outside of it. If there's any variable you want to use throughout your um, program, then of course you need to define it at the very top, but we'll cover that a little bit later. Okay, so let's get rid of that line here and let's start to write our function. Now that HTTK function, the SPR underscore get set position that we've been using up to now, is what interfaces with the hardware and updates the position of the sprite on the screen. So we're still going to need to use that within our own function that we're creating here. As previously discussed, it takes whole numbers, whereas we're asking for a fixed 32 number from the, from the programmer. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to first convert these numbers we're taking, the x and y coordinates as fixed 32 numbers, and we're going to have to convert them into whole numbers. So in previous previously, we did this before we fed it into the SPR set position, but that looks a bit messy in my opinion. So rather than doing that, we're going to do this within our function itself. The first step will be to create two new variables as S16 whole numbers. So we're going to call this whatever you want. I'm going to make it very descriptive. So enemy x as S16. And we're going to do that conversion that we did previously before we fed it into SPR set position. So we can do fix32 to int and within the brackets, we're going to put enemy x, which is of course a fix32 number. Of course, we're also going to have to convert the uh, fix22 y coordinates into a whole number two. So let's do that now. Okay, so now that we've converted them into whole numbers, we can feed them into that original SGDK function. So SPR set position. So we're going to need to give it the sprite we're going to be using. So put that as enemy sprite. And then instead of as enemy X or enemy Y, we're going to use this enemy X as S16 and enemy Y as S16. So as it stands right now, our new function is going to take the um, enemy sprite and it's going to take an enemy, uh, the X coordinates in terms of a fixed 32 number and the Y coordinates too. It's going to convert those fixed 32 numbers into whole numbers, into integers. And then it's going to feed that within the SGDK set position function. So we pretty much got the same uh, functionality as that, except that we've got the, uh, we're not counting for the camera yet so if we use this set enemy position instead of the regular one and instead of using it within the camera function let's go up and let's use it within the main game loop instead so just after the you call the camera function within the main game loop we're going to use our new function here so remember open the brackets and we need to give it three pieces of information and just as before we're going to need to give it to us what sprite we want to use and the x and y coordinates so use boss sprites then we're going to use um, the boss x and then we're going to use boss y and because within our function we've already got that um, conversion to an integer we don't need to do that whole fix 32 to int so just as a reminder this is how we define the um, our enemy sprite here and if we save and compile we'll get this result and as you can see, it's pretty much the same effect that we had before where we deleted that um, camera adjustment. So the uh, enemy just pretty much sticking to the same part of the screen all the time. To fix this within our own function, we're going to do the same as we did before. So we're going to subtract the um, new camera X and new camera Y just so the adjustment does. But you can see that we have a problem here. So it says new camera X is undefined. So this links into what we were talking about before, where if you define a variable within a function, it only exists within that function. And with new camera Y and new camera X, we define them within the camera function. So it means we can only use them within the camera function. We can't use them outside of that function. I also mentioned before that for any variable we want to use throughout our code, we're going to need to define it at the very top of our program. So the solution here is very simple. I'm going to cut the new camera X and Y, the definition from the camera function. And instead I'm going to put it at the very top with all these other ones. So anything above main here. So I think the best place is probably where we define the current camera Y and current camera X. So let's put that up there. And once we do that, we can see that we can not only use this new camera X and Y within the camera function, but anywhere else in our code, including in our new function here. 
And as we look at our new function, we can see that those error messages have gone away, so it should compile just fine now. And the end result is pretty much what we had at the very beginning of the lesson. So we've got it so that the enemy sprite is moving with the camera, but we still have the problem where he's reappearing again and again as we walk down the level. While it's nice that our new function takes the X and Y coordinates of each enemy as a fixed 32 number and does the conversion with the to the integer and the adjustment for the new camera within the function rather than having to do that every single time using the SPR set position uh, function we were doing before. It, that of course doesn't fix our little problem that we've been having so let's go ahead and tackle that now. Back within the set any position function we just created, we're actually going to be using an SGDK function that we learned a couple of lessons ago, the set visibility function. The main idea is to have a check on each enemy sprite on the map and see whether or not it falls within the current camera position. If it does, we set it to visible. If it's outside the camera position, then we set it to invisible. That in turn means that it will only show up on the map once whenever it's in within the camera positions, and so it will solve the little problem we've been having. Just as a little reminder of how to use this function, we have to give it two pieces of information, which sprite to apply the visibility to, and also whether it's going to be visible or invisible. So we can use true for visible and false for invisible, or actually we can use something else. We can use the words visible or hidden. So that just equates to true and false. So if you think that makes the code more readable, then you can write it that way instead. So how are we going to determine whether or not an enemy sprite appears on camera or not? And it might not surprise you that to do this we're going to be using an if statement. In this if statement we're going to be doing four checks and if any of these are true, if any one of them is true, it means that the sprite is off the camera, in which case we're going to make the sprite invisible. Fortunately we can just use the two variables we're already calculated, the enemy x as x16 and enemy y as x16. And we're going to, so the first one check we're going to do is enemy x as s16 if it's less than zero. Then we're going to remember these, um, these two horizontal lines it means or. So, and we have to put those within the brackets, not outside the brackets. So if enemy x is as 16 is less than zero, or if enemy x as s16 is greater than 320, which is of course our uh, screen resolution. So you can think of that as the boundaries of the camera, or if um, enemy y as s16 if it's less than zero or if it's greater than 224 and of course 224 is the vertical resolution of the screen and if you were using the low resolution mode the 256 mode of course you would do uh, enemy x as s16 if it's greater than 256 instead of 320. And be very careful when you're being lazy like me and doing lots of copying and pasting. Make sure you change what should be an x to a y and so on because I often make that mistake. So if any one of these conditions is true, it means that the enemy sprite is currently off camera, uh, off where the camera is on the its position on the map. In which case, of course, we're going to want to make the that particular sprite invisible. So within the brackets, if any one of these is true, then whatever's in the brackets will be acted upon. And the thing we want to be acted upon is the SPR set visibility, and we're going to set it to hidden or to false. On the other hand, if not a single one of these conditions is true, it means that the enemy sprite is currently on camera, in which case we want to make the if statement default to this else. So if it's on camera, then we want to, we're going to want to set it to visible, and we're also going to want to update the position of the sprite on the screen. So we're going to paste the SPR set position here. If I just clean this up a bit and delete any empty space, we should be able to view the entire function on screen at the same time. And this is pretty much complete, although there is one thing we, a couple of things we need to change before it works as we want it to. I don't, I'm not sure if you can guess, but in the meantime, let's save and compile and let's see how it looks in game. So starting from the beginning, let's start to move to the right. So, so far, so good. It's the same as the rest. But if we keep on going now, we can see that the enemy sprite isn't showing up a second or third time. It only shows up once where it's supposed to. So that's all working fine. Although I'm sure you've noticed there is a little bug we've got here is where the uh, when the enemy sprite gets close to the left of the screen, he disappears before he actually leaves the screen. So you, you see this sometimes in 8-bit games, which is quite normal, but in a 16-bit game, we can't really have this. It doesn't look quite right. So what do you think the problem is here? 
to make this a little more clear let's shift the position of the boss the x coordinates to the right a bit so it won't appear straight away you have to go to the right a bit before it does and while we're up here let's just take the when we wrote 320 and 224 in our code down below let's just replace that with those um defines we did uh, earlier so we can just paste the vertical and horizontal resolution here instead so it means that if in future we change we want to change the horizontal resolution we don't have to find where it is in the code we can simply change the um, horizontal resolution variable and vertical resolution variable we did before okay so back in our new rom you can see that the position of the enemy is 450 so he's not going to appear straight away but as we move a bit far to the right he appears then now when he appears on the right hand side we don't have that uh, early disappearing problem that we do on the left hand side so obviously is a problem with the left hand side and not the right so let's investigate this now the pink square here represents the screen or the current camera position on the level so let's say this is roughly where the enemy sprite is due to appear and if we take the enemy sprite here and we paste him onto the screen you'll see that if we move him to a point zero zero so zero x zero y coordinates on the screen then he'll appear in this top left hand corner here because bear in mind that the coordinates of any sprite is taken in by the top left hand corner of the animation frame from this position if the boss character keeps moving left in the current position then at the moment the x coordinates are zero but if he moves just one pixel more to the left it'd be minus one then minus two minus three in terms of the camera and so on and that's why the sprite will disappear early when he reaches towards the edge of the screen because at the moment if our in our code if the um, enemy sprite if the x coordinates in terms of the a position on the screen on the camera is less than zero he disappears so we need to give a bit more leeway we need to change this instead of having the enemy sprite become invisible once his x coordinates meet zero we're going to need to make it so that he becomes invisible once his um, x coordinates becomes minus the width of the sprite itself which will be about this position here doing it that way will mean that the disappearing of the sprite will happen just off screen so the player won't notice but it will stop him reappearing when we keep scrolling to the right since the width of our particular sprite here is minus 56, let's take the um, this zero here and let's change it to minus 56. So once the enemy X coordinates in terms of the screen and camera will be less than minus 56, only then will the sprite actually disappear. And as we move slowly to the right in our new ROM, you'll see that that has solved our little issues. So the sprite is still disappearing, but it's happening just off screen. So it's not affecting the player experience. If we were to change it, for example, to minus 26, you'll see that around half the um, sprite will be off screen before he disappears. So that's obviously not the effect we're looking for. So it definitely needs to be the around the width of the player sprite to make it work correctly. The right hand side is already fine, but if you want to play about with it just to solidify the concept of how this works in your mind, then change this for example to 200. Then if we save and compile, you'll see we'll be having a similar kind of problems on the right hand side now that we had on the left. So let's just change that back to where it was, the horizontal resolution or 320. Now for our map here today, we're only moving left to right, so that's not an issue. But for future reference, for future maps, especially if you had a map that moved up and down too, for example, an overhead Zelda map, we would experience the same issue on the top as we experience on the left. So at the moment, the boss character, he's Y coordinate zero. And if we go a little bit up from there, it'll become minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, and so on. So we have the same disappearing problem, early disappearing problem. So the solution is this, is to, instead of having the Y as less than zero in our little if statement, it's going to have to be less than minus the height of the particular sprite. So for our example here, if we change this figure, instead of less than zero to less than minus 80, then that should solve any problem you may have if you were to have the um, an up and down map as well as a left and right one. So as we have our code written right now, it should work perfectly fine with whatever map you have. So this is the completed code for our function here. And just to test it out a bit more, let's go ahead and let's add a second enemy sprite to the mix too. From the name, I think you can probably guess which sprite I'm going to be adding here. And again, we add it just after the boss sprite. And we're going to, again, we're going to call the our little function a second time, this time using the information from our new sprite. And if we save and compile, this will be the end result. So we get our slasher boss first, and then we get the fat man boss afterwards. So obviously the um, palette, I haven't organized the palette properly. I think at the moment it's just using um, Adam's palette. So it looks a bit funky. 
but of course you have to be careful when you're adding new enemies make sure that the pallets are set up properly but I'm just using this as a quick example to show you can add not only one but two three four or even more sprites to your level at the same time although you have to be careful about uh, exceeding any sprite limits or VRAM limits too. Okay so that's it for this tutorial thanks so much for watching if you're interested in this kind of content then don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I'm interested in this. And if you wish to support the channel further and want to get extra things, for example, the code for each lesson, then I have a patron and any support is much appreciated. You won't go unrewarded. Until next time. Farewell.